I have. Perfect. Well, hey, everyone, thank you for, for having me here and the, the invite. Um, I got a pretty simple uh, topic for tonight. That's, that's actually one of my favorite things to talk about. So I'm going to pull that up for you right now and I guess get started. I did bring a beer for this evening, trying to keep it somewhat social since everything has gone hybridized again between being in person and masked and virtual. So uh, try to, we'll try to keep this as fun as possible. If you have a question while I'm talking, it's more than fine uh, to raise your hand or put something into the chat. If I don't see it, whoever is a host, feel free to just interrupt me. That's totally fine by me. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and start the show from the beginning. So, so, so as Mike introduced, um, prior to being uh, now a graduate student researching Varroa and, and honeybee queens, I used to work for Michael Palmer. If you're not familiar with Michael Palmer, he's a, a pretty popular beekeeper on the Canadian border in upstate New York and Vermont. Um, his business is out of uh, St. Albans, Vermont. And so I worked for him for four years. And I, at the time, had a migratory operation between the coast of North Carolina and upstate New York. This is one of my yards um, in upstate New York. This is actually in the fall. And this picture essentially says everything that I want out of my bees by the fall. Um, this, is, this is a relatively warm day in the fall, which is why they're bearding. But you know, it depicts them as they are. These are colonies and condensed brood chambers. So essentially the honey supers have been removed. They are overflowing with healthy populations. Um, the Varroa have already been managed. Any colonies that had queen issues were requeened over uh, at least a month prior. We, we do this early in the season so that the new queen has an opportunity to rebuild the population prior to the onset of winter. And the colonies have been fed up in, up in this area, especially this year, I didn't really have to feed anything. Um, New York traditionally has a really strong um, fall flow in which bees are able to take care of themselves the winter. Um, if they don't, we do have to feed in the fall. Um, and so this topic is on one of those five things that I just talked about, which is just requeening. And I'll talk about how I do it in um, my operation, how we did it at Mike's, and then hopefully give you some practical ways uh, to do it yourself. And we wanna demystify a little bit of this, this re-cleaning. Um, we kind of scare the hell out of new beekeepers by telling them every single way that they could accidentally squish or kill their queen or lose her. And then when it does come time to actually re-clean, you, you, know, you have no background information really how to do that. So to start that, with, yes. And that first photo, the, the center hive, is that two colonies or one? Yeah, so um, so a little background. Yeah, it's two colonies and they're, and they're completely separate, but a little background information. Um, so I worked full time for Mike during the season, uh, which would be about April until whenever I finished up with him, uh, usually around October, which means I was often doing my work early, early morning or, or in the evenings, often like supering with a headlamp on. Uh, so if something looks askew in one of my pictures, it, it's simply the result of... Uh, being way too far behind. Uh, so the story with those two colonies right there is at the beginning of the season, um, I dropped uh, the first colony there on the hive stand. And then as I was unloading my trailer, by the way, I, never, I was never on forklift, so this is all done by hand. Um, it was just late at night. I didn't feel like going all the way down to the ground with this, with this uh, heavy colony. So I just placed it on top of this colony. You know, it's easier on your back. And I said, I'll take care of it the next morning. Of course, I fell asleep, slept right through, wasn't able to get there. The bees orientate. And I was, for the whole season, wasn't able to move that colony off of that colony. So I actually just ran them to his, um, on one vertical stack. And it, it, they were, it was ridiculously tall and, and just a pain in my ass. Uh, so that's why they look like that in the fall. Um, but anyways, I'm going to try to talk about requeening um, in terms of milk and cows. Um, and, and, and believe it or not, this actually does make sense. So um, beekeeping is really difficult to, to master, even to go from beginner to intermediate, because we ask you to learn in a way different than any other uh, way that you learn a task in your regular life. So um, in beekeeping, we have very few repetitions of tasks. 
what I mean is you usually do something once a year and then you don't get to repeat it till the next year. Uh, so we have a long time in between repeating a task. And a really good example is reversing colonies. Um, if you have to reverse your colonies, you do this in the spring and you do it once. So if you mess up reversing a colony, you don't get to practice again until the next spring. And by that time, conditions have changed. You might've done it in the perfect spring on your first year and it's a rainy spring your second year. This is a really bad feeling. Um, so this is why it's, it's actually really difficult to get proficiency. We usually have very little repetition, i.e. most people have one or two colonies. And then there's a long time in between tasks and then um, conditions change before you get to, um, to repeat them. That's completely opposite of almost anything else we learn, especially i.e. if you milk a cow. So halfway through college, I heard Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. was thrilled about the idea of being able to make a uh, living as a small farmer. That part didn't actually come through. Uh, but I switched majors, transferred schools, moved back to my grandfather's farm that he had shut down in the 80s. And, and we started this, this little, what you'd now call a boutique cottage farm. And, and I really wanted to sell raw milk and raw milk products. So the first thing I did was I, I got a, a milking shorthorn. Her name is Molly. She's your quintessential New England cow. And uh, hand milked her for, for about a lactation cycle and a half. And um, so if you've never milked a cow before, it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, you can't just, you know, look at the udder and milk squirts out. Uh, you have to balance yourself on a pail and I'm six foot one. So this is, this is a little difficult for me, especially with shorter cows. And, you know, you got to move her, her hind leg, leg back just a little to get to the teats. And then when you squeeze on the teats, you're not just squeezing, you're actually starting pressure here, releasing it as other fingers continue to add pressure. So you can kind of get that milk out of there both firmly enough to get the milk out without hurting the cow. Um, so for the first night, I got less than a quart from this girl, you know, this poor cow that's in milk. But I had to return to that very same task with the very same cow under the very same conditions that next morning, and then the next night, and then the next morning. And you get the idea, every 12 hours, you're practicing under the same conditions on the same cow. You become proficient at hand milking very, very, very quickly. One moment. <clears throat> And beekeeping is just not like that. So I really want to say it's actually much easier to learn um, an instrument or learn how to milk a cow or to pick up painting or even light carpentry than it is to do beekeeping because of these three inherent things that you don't get. So if you're finding it difficult, don't beat yourself up, especially when we get to something where there's a little bit of skin in the game, like having to requeen your colony. Anyways, long story short, Molly became a few other cows and we started selling a lot of butter and yogurt and hard cheeses and it was great. Now, this is obviously not cows. This is up at Michael Palmer's. And if you're not familiar with Mike, he's known for selling some really great high quality queens. At Michael Palmer's, we catch queens every four days. His grafting cycle, the, the iterations at which he produces queens happens every four days, which means during the season for roughly 10 weeks, every four days, approximately twice a week, we're catching queens. So the guy in the red shirt there is not a beekeeper at this very moment. It's his first year as a beekeeper. He's my best friend from uh, grade school. He got sick of being a lawyer. He quit being a lawyer and worked from South Georgia up to the Canadian border for his first year of beekeeping, working with Mike and then uh, myself and then Mike. And so long story short, uh, on when we're catching queens at Mike, we catch 158 in one day. So if you're not good at spotting a queen on the first day, you are by the end of that first day. Four days later, we're doing the very same task again in the similar colonies uh, with lots of repetition. So, so Rob became proficient at finding queens very quickly in that season, including picking them up and handling them. Most people don't get that opportunity. And so this is what I got at Michael Palmer's. Not only did I get a steadfast person to work with, you know, I was making queens and I had made, I had a few hundred colonies by the time I worked with Mike, but I didn't work any of them systematically. Now all of a sudden I'm working with someone who has, you know, all together about 1300 colonies between his nukes and his production colonies. And we work them all the same way on a system with repetition. So you learn very quickly, um, but you don't get to normally do that um, in your own bees, especially if you only have one or two. I'm taking this long uh, out of my talk to talk about this because I feel like it's that important. Uh, I don't want you to approach any task with beekeeping with trepidation or fear. 
And I also really want you to recognize if you don't feel like you're doing well now, it's the inherent uh, difficulties in learning beekeeping actually just stack the odds against you. Essentially, the casino is going to win here. Um, so it takes a lot of repetition. So one thing that I do here in Central Maryland, and I do at Tucka Seville now in Florida, is we offer these queen catch classes. Uh, you actually get to come out to our mating nukes. And you'll go through like 40 nukes with me in the morning and I'll hand you queens. You'll start picking up your own queens. If you drop in the grass, I'll find her. You know, no one gets, no one has to freak out. And you get tons of replication, repetition in these very small nucleus colonies to do what you would normally be afraid of if you only have one colony or two, which is you get to find a queen, pick her up, handle her, cage her, mark her. Um, and so you become proficient very quickly. The other thing we really like about repetition or beehives is you start to see similarities across colonies. If you only have one or two colonies, you, you really can't compare anything because you don't have very many replicates. But if I have a lot of replicates, then I can start to see um, patterns amongst those replicates. So for example, when we go into our mating nukes, sometimes we'll get a queen cell, like in this top up here on the right, and you can see that um, there's multiple eggs inside of it. I actually tore the queen cell open um, for this picture. And in the bottom is another queen cell that I tore open that has just one larva in it and some jelly. Does anyone know why, uh, which one is the normal one, which one's the abnormal one and why? Oh, and you might not be able to talk if they've, uh, if they haven't allowed it. So, so I guess I'll, I will just share why. So prior to a drone laying colony starting to lay drones, um, sometimes what they'll do is they'll make cups and they'll lay multiple eggs inside of those queen cups. When you see a queen cup with multiple eggs in it, 100% of the time, it's a laying worker colony now. There's no queen present. It's not one queen laying multiple cups in a swarm cell. It's actually just workers doing it. And so by having all of these colonies, we're able to kind of figure these things out relatively quickly. And we could discern them from, you know, a colony that has a normal queen cell. So I just want to reiterate, beekeeping is inherently unfair, and I think I've beaten to death the reasons why. Um, and so now what I'm going to do is start to jump into everything that in Beekeeping 101, people tend to make you really scared about doing, which is finding the queen and picking her up and not swishing her. So I first want to say you're not trying to find the queen, you're trying to isolate her. So uh, what I mean by this is when your colonies get very large and there's 50 to 100,000 workers in there, it, you we're trying to find one queen. So we want to make this task as easy as possible for us. Um, what we typically do in upstate New York is we'll bring multiple uh, 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 inner covers out into the field with us and we'll lightly smoke the colony and then we'll break the whole thing apart. We usually take the honey supers and just set them off on the side and then we will separate the brood box. Now, this is a pretty good picture for describing this. So Mike runs two deeps and a medium for his brood box. Everything on top of those is honey supers. So in the background here, there's a white box, there's a medium gray box, and then there's another white box. That's brood chamber. The blue box and that nasty olive colored box on top, those are the honey supers. So what I've done in, with the colony in front of it is I have to find this queen, I gotta requeen it is I took the honey supers off, which are these two here on the left. You can see the inner covers right on top. And then that's the brood chamber, a deep, a deep that I set off over here and a deep and a medium over here. What I did was I immediately broke the hive apart before I pulled out a single frame. When I do this, whatever box the queen was originally in, she's still in. If I open up my telescopic cover and then my inner cover, start to smoke and start to pull out frames, all I'm doing is pushing my queen down to the bottom of the colony. And in a really big colony like this, that means I'm going to go through, you know, 50, 60, 70 frames before I, before I actually find my queen. That's miserable. I'm going to get tired. The bees are going to get exacerbated. At that point, they start to get ugly and it's just not fun, right? So we want to separate them first. And if I'm working alone, the next thing is I just take a best guess at where I think she is. And I start and I start looking there. Um, so this is another example and just like kind of a cleaner pick. This is my intact colony on the left. And here is the colony taken apart on the right. 
wherever the queen was is uh, still where she is. I haven't pushed her down to the bottom of the hive. Um, this is just a re uh, another iteration. This is Jeremy in upstate New York. He lives in Vermont. He's a school teacher. He's an awesome guy. And he's a really good beekeeper. And that's what he's doing right here. He's, he took the colony apart. He took some beekeeper intuition thinking that the queen's going to be in this box. And he started pulling out frames. If he's wrong, it's okay. He's only gone through 10 frames. Wherever the queen originally was, she still is in that box. Uh, you can also tell we put some box vertical. We'll do this in upstate New York. We, we don't have much of a dearth where we keep um, our bees up there, and we can really get away with leaving honey supers fully exposed as we work a colony. It's, it's actually really amazing. Um, when we're going through our colony to try to find our queen, uh, I do two things. One is I pull out whatever frame I think is the easiest to pull out. Sometimes in beekeeping school, people want you to pull out that middle frame. Um, and I think the logic uh, I'm sorry, they want you to pull out this the second to the last frame. And the logic there is the queen's unlikely to be on there. And, um, you know, you should be able to pull it out. Well, if there's brood on your second to last frame, then the queen was there at some point. So the idea that she shouldn't be there is she, she doesn't know our rule book, right? So in this case, that second to last frame was the easiest frame to pull out. I pulled it out. But if the middle frame is the easiest one to pull out, I just pull out the middle frame. I just want uh, the frame with the least junk on the bottom or on the top so that as I remove it, I'm not dragging burr comb across brood and destroying it, and I'm not risking squishing too many bees. Uh, once I pull out a frame, I'm just scanning the frame. And if I don't see the queen on the frame, what I'll do is I will stack those frames at a slight angle against my hive or something that's propped, and then just continue to layer the frames until I find the queen, as you see in that right-hand picture. By doing so, I'm actually stacking my frames as if they're um, pages from a book. And the bees will just continue doing their own things on those frames. They actually stay pretty natural. This is possible if you don't heavily smoke. Um, and lightly smoke and heavily smoke is just subjective. So um, what I usually describe is I'm using a sufficient amount of smoke so that the bees do not enter an alarmed and defensive state. I'm not using so much smoke that the bees stop doing their normal social behavior on the frames. When you do like this, your whole beekeeping changes. Now you're able to open up a colony and you can see the bees engaging in their normal, normal behavior, right? They're trophallaxising, they're sticking their head into pollen cells, and brood cells. They're, you know, cannibalizing brood in front of you. It's really cool to watch, right? And if you've been such in a habit of uh, heavily smoking your colonies, you miss all of these learning opportunities and observation periods that you could have. Um, this also really allows us to find a queen much easier. So again, I want to uh, scan for her, not try to just find her. By scan her, I'm just looking left and then right across the frame, and I'm going back and forth with my eyes doing that. I'm not trying to look for one individual bee at a time. What I'm doing is I'm scanning across the frame until I find her. And then you can see right there, if you didn't know, notice already, there's a blue dot queen. And um, she's right there. Now I'm going to back up one second with my little circles. And I want to point out a couple things. So um, life would be a lot easier if we could breed queens that were born with a, a dot on them but we're not there yet. So if you have unmarked queens, don't worry. Most of my queens are unmarked and I still find them pretty regularly because I'm not looking for her. I'm looking for a couple things that she's doing. One, your queen's gonna have a pretty distinct way that she walks on the comb. She kind of has this little back and forth swagger with her um, and bees will move for her. So a mated queen, the other bees in the colony can sense. And as she's walking, they will move apart so she stays walking on the surface of the comb. You can see this here where she is directly on the surface of the comb and there's a retinue around her. When you start to get enough repetition, you will notice that retinue in her movement. The uh, most analogous thing I can think of is a hunter who will say, oh, I can't believe I saw her. You know, I didn't really see the deer. I just saw a flick of the tail or a, a twitch of her ear. You never see the whole deer at first. It's only until you see that movement. You actually pick up on these things the moment you get to increase that repetition. Remember earlier I said Rob became pretty good at finding queens really quickly? He had to. Every four days, he had to help find almost 160 queens. 
just just by that repetition, he's going to get good at finding them. And so if you don't have that repetition, don't beat yourself up, but you're trying to find, again, this retinue and her movement, um, not necessarily uh, looking for a queen's body herself. Um, handling a queen. So bees are just like us. We've got a head, chest, and tummy. On bees, we just call it a head, thorax, and abdomen. Tummy and abdomen are the same thing. And so if it's squishy on you, it's squishy on them. So you would come and give me a hug around my chest. You wouldn't run up and give me a hug around my belly. That would be really, really, really weird, um, especially if it was like at a conference or something. And then I'm just kind of like this tall guy stuck there with someone like hugging around my waist, right? Well, think of it as weird as that for a queen if you were to grab her by her squishy abdomen. Her abdomen is essentially, oh, I wish I had a picture of dissecting queens this year. Uh, is essentially just ovaries. It's just a massive amount of ovaries in there. So her, her essentially her sexual reproductive organs are just stuffed into her abdomen. Don't squeeze them. Um, but what we can do is we can pick her up both by the thorax and the wings. I really wish I could show you right here. Instead, I have three pictures. So um, holding the queen, once you find her, you can pick her up by the wings. You just grab her by both wings. If you try to grab her by both wings and miss, she's gonna to start to run. Um, it just becomes more difficult to find her. I usually let her settle down or I'll take a finger and just uh, kind of put it in front of her and I'll usually get her to stop. You can pick her up by the thorax, either side by side or top and bottom. So in the middle picture, I'm top and bottom and on the right picture, I'm side by side. Actually, it's backwards, but you know, whatever. And that's a really safe way to pick her up. You'll see us in the bee yard, especially if one person has the marking pen, I'll just pick her up and then hand them to someone while I'm holding both wings and they'll grab her side by side on the thorax and marker. So once you can get this skill, it's just like having another tool in your tool belt. If you never need to mark a queen or cage her, picking her up by the wings is still a really handy skill to pick up. If I'm working a colony and I pull out a frame and oh, wow, the, the queen's right here and I know there's a part of the colony I'm not gonna go back into again, I'll pick her right up by the wings, place her into that colony, let's say it's the bottom brood box, and I know she's safe. She's back in the colony, she's surrounded by her girls, and I can pull out every single frame from the rest of the colony and not even worry about squishing her. So it's kind of this cool tool. I don't have to do anything freaky with the frame that I'm holding. So now that I just talked quite a bit about, don't, don't worry, we kind of teach you beekeeping wrong and make you scared, to handle your queens in the first place. It takes a lot of repetition, finding a queen and handling a queen. We're now gonna go into three different ways in which you could requeen a colony. Um, there's pros and cons for every single method here. And so I'm gonna just state um, the pros, the cons, and why I do it and when I do it. Um, and, and then afterwards, I'll take plenty of questions by the time I get to the pushing cage, it's, it's probably the most intricate one. So if there's some questions, just someone flag me and I'll pause the uh, presentation at that point. We can, we can answer any questions there. But we'll start off with requeening with the nuke. So um, we requeen with the nuke for a couple reasons. One, we're queen and nucleus colony producers. So we have extra nucleus colonies, especially in the spring. So we requeen weak colonies that overwintered and are alive, but aren't super strong or even mediocre uh, with nucleus colonies really early in the season in upstate New York and Vermont. We do this because we want to change over the queens and we also want to boost a population. So a really good example is this colony on the left is totally alive, survived the winter, good job for them, but they're not going to win any like great prizes for surviving the winter, right? Like I'm not expecting a honey harvest from this colony. And most likely if it has a queen issue, I'm not expecting it to be alive for the next year. So I have to do something with it. Uh, by the way, in the early season, the first thing I do with colonies like this is I immediately go in for an underlying brood disease. If you can catch um, a communicable disease, so we're talking chalk brood, EFB or AFB super early, you protect all of your other colonies. And so we rarely pull frames this time of the year. But when we get into weak colonies like this, we'll always pull a frame. Uh, there's some logic there. The colony on the right, I assume there's nothing wrong with it. It's overflowing with bees and it's, it's heavy and, and we haven't even really had a, a nectar flow yet. The colony on the left, I know there's some sort of underlying issue. 
I want to exclude a couple of the really bad issues. So if it's something like EFB or, or AFB, um, we want to identify that really early on and then know that this whole yard needs to be isolated and take uh, proper management. You know, if it's something like chalk or something that be fixed with re cleaning, then we do that. Um, but if it's just a, a queen issue, what we'll end up doing is we'll requeen it with the nucleus colony. Now, I have a picture over on the right with a red arrow, and that's exactly what's happening in this yard. I have a colony that overwintered. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with the colony. Otherwise, they, other than they need a new queen and the colony's weaker as a result of not having a queen building up the population early in the season. And so what I did was I placed a nucleus colony on top of that colony. Uh, depicted by the red arrow. You might not be able to tell by depth of feel, but it's actually a five frame box on top of a 10 frame colony. What I'm gonna end up doing is uh, finding the old queen, squishing her and doing a newspaper recombine um, to requeen this colony. And again, my goal is to change over the queen and boost population. Uh, we really like this for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, the nectar flow up north is, is massive we can make quite a bit of money from honey. Uh, so colonies that are non-honey producers uh, essentially cost us quite a bit of money because we have to do all of the management to keep them alive until the next year, but we get no reward from them. So if I can do something that's really low labor cost, because this time of the year I'm really busy, low labor cost, but I still get my honey reward later, then I'm going to do it. Requeening with a nucleus colony does that for me. If I just threw a queen in there, I'm essentially throwing a queen into a weak colony. She will, if she's accepted, you know, she's going to start laying and they'll build up, but they might not build up in time for my nectar flow. If I take a five frame or a 10 frame nucleus colony, essentially do a newspaper unite, I instantly boosted up the population and we still expect to make a few hundred dollars in honey. Um, our main flow kicks in around the first week of July. So um, again, I do want to acknowledge something right here. Mike and I and others, we, we produce nucleus colonies. So in the spring, we have surplus extra overwintered nucleus colonies. Um, so for us, they're just a resource in our apiaries. If, if you do not do this, then, then I'm essentially telling you to requeen a weak colony with a $200 nuke. Um, that, that doesn't sound very logical, and I, I understand that. Uh, so just bear with me and understand that for, the, for those of you that have surplus queens and or nukes in the spring, you could do this. And if you don't, you might want to get here because it totally changes your beekeeping. So we have these overwintered nucleus colonies, and what we'll do is we'll ch and they're in and they're in these vertical stacks that are narrow, uh, which I won't go into now. We transfer them to ten frame equipment so they match the production colony in shape and size that we're going to put them onto. Um, we bring them to the new yard, and uh, what we need to do is again find that old queen. This is usually pretty easy because. Uh, it's a smaller, weaker colony coming out of the, the winter. And we're going to combine, we're going to squish her, and then we're going to combine these two colonies with newspaper. Uh, over on the right, any time in Mike's operation of mine, you see newspaper between two boxes, it was a unite at some point, um, usually the year before. Uh, at this time of the year, again, just keep the brood intact. Don't checkerboard anything. Um, and you want to ensure the queen's there. You know, last thing you want to do is transfer a queenless nuke. Um, it's cold this time of the year up there. We'll still get freezing nights. So don't do something like checkerboarding, which is where you take um, empty comb or foundation and put it in between uh, brood comb. Those bees need to be able to cluster when it gets cold at night. And if you're not familiar, bees will uh, warm themselves in several different ways this time of the year. Um, yes, they'll you know vibrate the wings and make a tight cluster and they keep one that way. But there's also bees that go into an empty cell and they uh, vibrate really, really quickly, and they become super, super warm. Uh, I think it's something ridiculous, like 54 Celsius. Um, and it warms all of comb around them. As the moment you start checkerboarding, especially if you put foundation, um, you, you break their ability to thermoregulate. So, so just don't do it. This isn't a time of year where we're worried about swarming. But I really emphasize because of how often the internet will um, promote something like checkerboarding. And this is really not the time you want to do something like that. Um, and sorry, I can't see because Zoom has this thing up here. Um, and so, yeah, so anyways, uh, so I'm going to go through step through step for requeening with the nuke right here. So the first thing you're going to do is identify the colony that you want to uh, requeen. 
This is this is actually now back down in Maryland for a demo. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out everything that this colony really doesn't need. I'm going to condense it down. Um, and you need to isolate the old queen. And once you find her, you need to offer. This is a nice way of saying squish. Um, and, 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 I, and if you haven't squished a queen yet, it, it's, yeah, it's kind of cathartic. Um, you know, you'll feel a little different afterwards, but you got to do it. Um, we want to get these things through the winter. Um, and this is really not a time to second guess yourself. What, what will sometimes happen is someone will get here and they'll find one nice frame of brood. Um, and they'll be like, oh, well, maybe she's coming around, she's trying, and, and this isn't like the everyone gets a trophy in soccer. Um, this, this is really that this is gonna be a failed queen by the winner and the whole colony is gonna die. So just offer. Um, and um, if you noticed, I put the nucleus colony beside it. You can do this several days ahead of time. Those bees will orientate there. When I move this nucleus colony, they'll still orientate to the next box next to them. So you don't confuse the bees or anything. Uh, so this is not a time sensitive technique. Um, and then you're going to do a newspaper you, uh, recombine, put the nucleus colony together in the center and extra frames on the outside. If you don't have extra frames, just use comb frames or something. Uh, in this case, I only had foundation with me. And of course, the one time I need to do a demo, I don't have a newspaper. I, I just have lab notebook paper. Um, and uh, reconstruct the colony, put the lid on. Now, uh, queens naturally supersede top down. So by putting the queen up at the top, we're simply uh, emulating that uh, behavior in honeybees that if they were to make a supersedure cell, uh, they, they would requeen top down. Also by putting the queen and the whole nucleus colony up on top and the old existing colony down below, we're protecting these, these girls up here from the forager bees. Um, I know some of the older texts had said, you know, want to unite with the new colony on the bottom. And that's really not the way you want to go around it. Again, you have all these forager bees coming in going, what the hell is going on? This doesn't smell like my, so we just put them on the top. It's more natural, it's easier on the bees. Uh, and within a day, they'll be um, chewed through that paper and, and start to uh, initiate contact with each other. The only time we don't use newspaper is if we unite this time of the year, and that's, that's a different topic. Um, so again, just to kind of reiterate, this is the recap. Early season, we like to do this so we still make a honey flow. I will do this mid late season because you get a population boost when there might not be enough time with a queen alone to requeen. Uh, this is Kate Blossom. She's a, she's a great beekeeper. Um, she still works with Mike. Um, she's a, almost my height, she's a pretty tall girl. And she's standing on top of a, well, you can see what she's standing on. And if you look where the red arrow is, there's some newspaper. So this was a, uh, a requeen with a nucleus colony in early April. And so this is the brood chamber right here, that, that coffee colored, cafe colored box, everything on top of its honey. So we got a deep and one, two, three, we got four mediums on top of that of all honey. So again, you know, we took this investment into our colony, which is we provided a new queen through a nucleus colony. We got back that investment plus some in the form of honey. And we also got back that investment in the form of uh, a colony that's now strong enough to go through this next winter. So if this is done early and, and properly, it's a win-win, which is really great. Um, so I'm going to pause for a second, take a sip of my beer, and encourage you to grab whatever you're drinking. Zach. <clears throat> yeah. Can we take a quick break before we move on? There were a couple of queen catching questions. Yeah, yeah, um, go ahead. Okay, one was when picking up the by the wings, are squeezing the two wings together, or are you grabbing them so you're holding the two wings by the tops and bottoms? Yeah, gotcha. Uh, no, you're holding them flatly. Uh, so when you come down, you can pinch side by side. You're still going to end up grabbing them flatly, uh, and you're essentially pinching the two wings together and kind of holding them like a, a little handle. Um, it's, it's as simple as I just described. And um, when you go to do it, if you miss a wing, she's going to spin around on you and you're going to freak out. Um, I can't tell you anything. I mean, just drop her over a hive or drop her into the palm of your hand. Uh, you're most likely not going to cause harm to her doing it that way. Okay. One other question was about the use of gloves. Mm -hmm. And I assume you're not using gloves. No. <laughs> so, so I should also say this. Um, um, my bees are really, really, really nice. So I've been breeding the same uh, bees for, oh, geez, I'm feeling old now. It's over 10 years. Um, 
and the the thing that I read out is is um, any type of aggressive or defensive behavior. So I mean, I can pet my bees. I work largely without a veil, um, and actually keeping my 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 breeding line and coming down here in Maryland, it's allowed me to do the research that I can do because um, my undergraduate helpers and I can actually stand right out in front in front of a hive and hand pick up thousands of bees and take very 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 few stings. Usually when we get stung, it's our fault. Um, so so you'll notice in all of my pictures, um, I don't have gloves on. Um, I often don't have a veil. I, I highly recommend wearing a veil. Um, because, you know, even in a really nice hot colony, it only takes one sting to the nose to kind of ruin your day. Um, but no, I can get away with that. If you don't have super, super nice bees, then my recommendation is start requeening because there's, there's, it's kind of like, you know, dating. If, if any of you are dating right now, if you're dealing with someone that has too many iffy things, there's, there's someone better out there. I guarantee it. Just, just go. So uh, as a compromise, would nitrile gloves maybe be a compromise? Yeah, nitrile yeah. gloves are great. The bees can still sting through them, but they have a tendency not to. Also, it takes them a little longer usually, so you can always squish the bee attempting to sting through you through that glove. Uh, the only problem with nitrile gloves is if one rips and you need to replace it, your hands are usually sweaty, and it's very difficult to do that in a bee yard. Um, down in Brazil, you know, we'll use dishwashing gloves, nitrile gloves, or leather gloves. Um, and I really like either the dishwasher gloves or the um, nitrile gloves if you're working with a, a defensive hive. Okay, great. Cool. Sweet. So I'm, I'm going to jump onto this thing called requeening with a push in cage. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's probably the most intricate way to requeen a colony. Um, it's a super high success rate, and that's why we do it at Michael's. But there's a bunch of cons to it. Um, it's very time sensitive. You need to be able to simultaneously find the old queen and handle your new queen. Um, you also need to have a frame of emerging brood. So there's four things right there, or there's three things right there that make it pretty difficult. Um, so, so again, if, you, if you're inconsistent with finding a queen, not the method for you. Uh, if handling a queen is difficult for you, not the method for you. Or practice just understanding you might lose a queen. Um, and, and again, if uh, at this point, you should be able to identify what emerging brood is. If not, I'm going to totally go over it right here and encourage you next time you're in a hive, you might still have some brood, just try to identify some. Um, so this is everything you're going to need for this method. Um, there's a, a dark black magic marker that's really important. You have your new queen in her shipping cage. You have a uh, what's called a push-in cage. This is number eight hardware cloth, roughly three by a three by five inches. Don't be anal when you make it. Approximate is fine. Um, that's been cut on all four corners, so it becomes a little cage. And then a frame of emerging brood. Uh, it's, it's relatively easy to find a frame of emerging brood. The queen generally starts somewhere in the center of a frame and makes concentric laying rings outwards. So your youngest bees on a frame typically are on the outside and the oldest are on the inside. So if you find a, a dark patch somewhere, or even a large dark patch, um, look just outside that patch. And you'll often see bees starting to chew the cell cappings. This is called emerging brood. Um, what we're going to do here, I'll just give the whole spoiler alert right here on this frame, is we're going to kill the old queen. So she's gone. She's off. We want you know, Tony Soprano on her ass. And then we're going to release this new queen into our into our hands, we're holding her, and we're going to take our push-in cage, and we're going to essentially bear trap it over her and push it right down into the emerging brood. She's stuck in prison underneath this wire mesh cage, and we're going to put her right into the belly of the bees. We're going to put her into a new hive, and what's going to happen is the adult bees can't sting her. They can't ball her. They can't touch her because she's protected by this wire cage that they can't pass through. And then the newly emerged bees are going to come out and go, ah, queen, oh my gosh. You know, like they, they were so excited to see her. And then it's the first day that they get to be with her. They can't sting for 24 hours. So she's totally safe hanging out with them. Because they just emerged from those cells, uh, they'll get cleaned out by those bees the next day and she can start to lay in them. So we found this like really intricate way of introducing a queen. It's a pain in the butt, but the success rate's really great. Um, so this is what it'll look like in the end. Um, 
where I put my queen underneath his cage, pushed her in, and then a few days later, um, uh, I can go back and release her. When she's in that cage, she can lay into all of those open cells. Her pheromone will spread throughout the colony and she'll become the laying queen of the, of the hive. So, so this is really simply how we're gonna introduce uh, the new queen. And uh, we're gonna introduce her back into the hive to do this. Um, I just, I run nine frames in my brood box. Most people I understand run 10. So if you run 10 frames, um, you're, you're gonna have to remove a frame temporarily from this colony because there's not gonna be enough space uh, for that frame with the pushing cage against it to go into the colony. Uh, that pushing cage can't be right up against um, the, the face of it can't be up against the next frame. If it's brood, it'll kill all the brood in that three by five area. Um, if it's honey, you really risk your queen just getting drenched in honey and those newly emerged bees won't be able to clean her off. So you need to have a little bit of space there. And I'll just typically look down and, and guesstimate three eighths of an inch or bee space so bees can pass from the face of that frame. Um, that black magic marker is extremely important. So um, we use indicators to communicate to ourselves and other people that we work with what we're doing in our, in our operation. Um, with the black magic marker up in this picture in the upper left, here with 726.7 literally means the queen is here under a pushing cage and I placed her in here on July 26, 2017. And every time I give this presentation, I feel older and older. Um, um, and QOK 737 uh, literally means, this, this is shorthand for, hey, I showed up and noticed that a queen was under this pushing cage for four days. We released them at four days. I released her. She walked right off of the frame. None of the bees attacked her. She's okay. And I'm just letting you know that I released her. So this is how we communicate to each other. You know, here, she's under a pushing cage. I released her four days later. Um, Black Magic Marker will also put arrows on top of the frame. So I know she's in this box. And once I open the box, those arrows tell me exactly which frame she's on. You can't quite tell, but there is B space um, right here. Um, the stone over here is really important. Um, at, at, we use telescopic covers and we don't like the wind to blow them off. So we always have a stone on top of them. Uh, and now we use the stone for communication as well. If you're not familiar with doing this, um, uh, a stone in the front means the colony is super strong. Uh, in the middle means it's medium. In the back means the colony is weak or has an issue. If the stone's up on edge, it means the colony is dead. Um, and so, if I'm working with other people, let's say I did all of this requeening on Wednesday and on Sunday, someone has to release them. Um, and let's say it's not me. I can just tell them, hey, in this yard, there's three colonies, um, the stones are in the back and they'll show up and they visually have a cue of which three colonies. Confirmation comes from what I wrote on the colonies. If I forget to write on a colony, but I remember to do the stone, then I'm still communicating properly. Uh, I'm gonna hear about it, especially if it's one of the, you know, the older grouchy beekeepers, but you know, you're trying to communicate the best. I can't remember what I do once I leave the yard. So I'm always doing something like this. Um, I will pause for a second and also just do an aside. During your supering season, a typical thing I'll do is if I'm out in a yard working a colony or working colonies and I don't have enough honey supers with me, I'll take grass, just a big handful of green grass, and I'll put it underneath the stone on top of a colony of every colony that needs honey supers. Before I leave the yard, I just count up how many colonies have grass underneath the stone and I text myself that number. And so the next day when I'm loading up the truck, I'll just count up what my texts were and be like, okay, I need 37 supers. I'll look, throw them onto the truck. And when I show up to my yards, I don't even have to remember or do anything. I literally just smoke the colony, crack the top honey super, put it on top of an empty, put it and in five minutes, I could be out of the yard. So some of these, really low tech ways is a great way to communicate to yourself. Um, anyways, long story short, going back to the Queens, you've got to leave her there for four days. There's this incubation time where she has to start laying and her pheromone has to be released and permeate through the colony. And she has to get accepted, even though she's still under that pushing cage, doing it earlier than that risks uh, her getting slaughtered. When you release her, she will just walk off the comb. It's the most anticlimactic thing ever. Unfortunately, you're going to hear my voice here. 
So remove the back frame. Pull out your cage frame. Here's the queen. She's going to walk off like no one cares. <laughs> She's the grand queen of the hive now. So, so that's it. Um, I placed her underneath the push in, and when I released her, she just walked off. The only reason she looks like she kind of ran off there is I, I needed the video and I put her back under the cage, and that was the second time she actually had to get handled by me. Um, and so there's that. There's also video, I believe, online of either uh, what's his name? Uh, Richard's going to get, oh, Richard, Richard Noel in, uh, in Brittany, France. Um, or Mike Palmer, both have, I believe, videos on YouTube doing this in action, and, and it's a great thing to watch. Um, but again, it's really time sensitive. So this last method is called bees above an excluder or the Doolittle method. Um, this is my favorite way to requeen a colony. Um, it's something that everyone can do. It's super efficient, even if you're a commercial beekeeper. That's also an excellent way to make nucleus colonies. So this is the one I'm really going to emphasize that you try if you need to requeen a colony. And I'll talk about it. Um, and in some ways, we're just rethinking how we use a queen excluder. Queen excluders are largely used to keep your queens out of your honey supers so that you can harvest honey without taking brood. But that is not the only way you can use a queen excluder. And in fact, if you only look as a queen excluder in terms of honey production, then you're missing out on this awesome tool that could be in your tool set. Um, over here, uh, I think I said earlier when I worked for Mike, you know, I only got to work my bees on the margins of the day. Mike got, you know, got me for eight to 12 hours a day. Um, and so one evening, I, I really needed to find this queen. I couldn't. So I just shook the whole hive in front of the entrance, put a queen excluder on top of the um, bottom box, and then restacked the whole colony back together. Um, you can actually do this super, super quick. Um, and when I came back the next day, all of the bees had gone inside. It didn't look like this. And, and the queen's stuck in the bottom box. She can't go up to the other uh, five boxes there. So she was really easy to find. Um, again, this is just a kind of a creative way to use a honey super. Um, so what we're going to end up doing is we're going to draw nurse bees up through a queen excluder. And we're going to isolate the old queen down below the queen excluder. Um, when we do this, we have bees that cannot, well, we have a, a queenless section where the queen can't be, and we have a queen section. We're gonna insert essentially a cloak board. It's gonna be an inner cover, but it can be anything that separates the two colonies completely. And now all of a sudden you have two colonies on a vertical stack. And we're then gonna introduce a queen right in the pushing, or right in the shipping cage that she came in, directly to the top stack, um, because nurse bees readily accept a new queen. This is the visualization of it. I'm going to start here with the colony I want over by number one. I'm going to creatively with the queen excluder and then an inner cover temporarily make a nucleus colony or, you know, in terms of a second colony on top of my old colony. I'm going to introduce the queen right into that green box on the top. And then at an undisclosed time later, it could be up to a month. I'm going to recombine these together, just like we did with our newspaper recombine earlier. And so this is the overview. If you're still lost, don't worry at all. I'm going to be very iterative and, re and repetitive with this um, until you get it. Um, so this is my original colony. This is in Maryland. Uh, I used to be teamed up with another researcher here, and we produced queens and nukes. And I had this colony that needed to get requeened also needs to get a haircut. Oops. Um, so um, what I am going to do is I'm going to make a nucleus colony above a queen excluder on top of this colony. And I'm going to do so with no adult bees whatsoever. So I'm going to brush all of the bees off of, off of this colony right into the face of the entrance. Literally no adult bees. I'm going to have a naked frame. And, and I'm being really clear here, just like absolutely no adult bees. Now, if you're really good at not finding a queen, you can just shake most of the bees off and then look for the queen. But the, I would really want to emphasize, we want to make a queenless nuke. So I have my empty box on top of a queen excluder. 
and I'm going to start loading brood frames into it. Um, I'm just going to make a nucleus colony. So, you know, two or three frames of brood, a frame of honey, and a frame of mixed. Mixed could be whatever, some brood, some pollen, doesn't matter. Um, and it's going to end up looking like this in the end over on the left. I've got my honey frame over here. I might have another honey frame with pollen or whatever. It's kind of like this, you know, mediocre frame over on the way right. And in between, I have three frames of brood. Um, because this is a 10 frame box, I'm just going to fill it with empty frames for the rest of it. Now there's no adult bees up there. You can see there's just a couple on the outside um, and there's no queen. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the cover on and I'm going to leave. So three frames of brood, two frames of honey or whatever on top above a queen excluder, no adult bees. And I'm going to leave. I'm going to, I'm going to go in and have coffee, you know, watch a rerun of some of the show because the pandemic's been going on for almost two years. Um, and, and I'm going to come back out 12 hours later. So if I do this in the evening, I'll come out the next morning. And it worked. What happened was bees came up through the queen excluder to cover that brood. Uh, queen, uh, I don't have that. So, so uh, nurse bees, if, there's, if there were 10 commandments of the beekeeping world, one of them is nurse bees attend brood. They do not like unattended brood. If they have unattended brood, they will leave where they are to go to that naked brood. And that's exactly what they did. There's another 10 commandments of the, uh, bee, of the beehive, which is nurse bees are traitors. They don't care what flag is flying on top of the colony. They just want a queen. So if you isolate them from the queen and give them a new one, they'll readily accept her. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this next step. I want Before I go there, I want to make a, a quick aside. Um, when people first start making their own nucleus colony, there's always this fear that I'm making the colony incorrectly. You know, am I pulling the queen? Did I take enough bees? Did I take too many bees? I started this with no bees whatsoever. I covered it up and left it for 12 hours. And when I came back, the bees self-regulated how many bees needed to cover that area. I didn't do that, they did it. So my confidence is the bees know best, they are covering those frames appropriately. If I wanted to take that whole 10 frames and walk it right away, right now, I've got a really great nucleus colony. I could just add a queen. That's not what we're doing here, but it's a really good uh, part of this talk for me to stop and kind of make that aside. So what I have right here is uh, a colony that's self-regulated by nurse bees. They're covering up some brood that I put above a queen excluder, it's queenless. I'm now going to separate the colonies. Uh, so extra inner covers are super awesome in your, in your operation. Uh, most of them have a feeding hole. If you take duct tape and place it on each side of that hole, it's now a solid barrier that bees can't pass through. But someone took a dado blade and cut out this nice little scoop for us, right? So I'm going to use that little, little inlet right there as my entrance for my new colony. And what I'm going to do is put it backwards. So um, I have an entrance here. My old hive entrance is on the other side. And now I have a new colony separated from the old colony. All I have to do is add my, my queen cage. I've already placed it in there. It's this little block of wood right here. If you can see my mouse by my, my uh, the mouse pointer by my finger. And I took, I just put it right in. They'll eat out the candy and she'll self-release. Again, nurse bees are traitors. They will readily accept her. It's awesome. Um, this is a very safe method for introducing a queen. It means you don't have to handle the queen and it's not time sensitive. Um, and now you wait. So you need to wait long enough that this queen is released and is laying, um, and then you'll end up recombining them. Um, recombining them is essentially we just do a newspaper recombine. Um, I want to take this moment, though, to say you don't need to um, do this all immediately, and none of this is time sensitive. So let me go back a few slides right up to here. So we have all three steps right here, right? We have our start, we have the temporary nuke, and then we have our unite. Well, let's say you're buying queens and a really good buddy of yours says that he's gonna catch some queens, he's gonna have some extras, or she's gonna have some extras. They're gonna bring them over to you and uh, you'll be able to do your, your requeen. Well, um, if most of us have some sort of trepidation, like, hey, if I, when do I squish my queen? Do I squish the queen before he, he or she brings it over? 
is if they don't show up on time, now I have a queenless column that's going to make queen cells, right? Uh, if I wait until they show up the queen, can I add her right away? You know, we, we freak out about these things. Is she okay for a night on my kitchen table? Then that next day it rains and you can't even get into your hive. And your kid has baseball. And you, you really start to freak out about, you know, how long can I keep this queen in the cage? Is the colony that I squished the queen in making queen cells? It is. This method um, allows you to skip any of that worry. So over here, before you do this solid excluder, when you just have a queen excluder on there, let's say your buddy is going to come over on a Wednesday and he calls you on Wednesday or she calls you on Wednesday and they're like, hey, I'm so sorry. I can't come today, but I can come tomorrow. And you're like, okay, no worries. And they're like, no, 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 I'm so sorry. And you're like, yeah, don't worry. You can come Friday. It's fine. And they're like, no, no, seriously, I don't want you freaking out about your queen. I'm like, no, no, just bring her. Everything's fine. I already, everything's set up in the backyard. You, you can leave that queen excluder on there for a week, no issues. They're still going to be covering that brood. It's, it's a few frames of brood above you know, the honey supers and everything. It's going to be fine. Can't wait too long because once the brood emerges, there's no more brood to cover and you lose all your nurse bees. Um, um, so you have some flexibility with that timing. You also have some flexibility at the very end of this. This is the part where you have to find the old queen and unite them, right? If you can't find that old queen right away on the day that you want to, relax, breathe, put the whole thing back together and try again the next day. You have some flexibility here, uh, which is why I really like this requeening method. Um, there's another cool thing is uh, you're actually having two queens lay in the same vertical stack at the same time. So you are boosting the population at the same time while you don't need to handle them and you have some flexibility with timing. Uh, so if you're juggling a job and, and some other things, this is a really great method. Uh, the final step is unite. So again, you pull away that, um, that inner cover that we had been using to separate the two colonies. We use newspaper and we essentially just do a newspaper recombine at this point. The old queen's dead, your new queen's up here and accepted, and now it becomes one after they get united through that newspaper. I have two pictures here for a very easy reason. Um, we try to keep colonies so that brood is intact with the brood. So you have one brood chamber. You don't want brood, honey, brood. So um, if, if this is you know partial brood and some honey, fine, I'll just leave it like this. No, no big issue. If this unpainted box right here is, is all honey, then, then I have brood chamber up here now because this queen's been up here for a bit length. And I have brood down here. And I essentially have a honey wall. Um, this, this just isn't helpful. Knock some of these bees out. You don't have to knock them all, but knock a significant portion of them out. Um, and if you're not into like knocking um, boxes, you're, you're probably not going to like working with me. Um, and just place it on top of the green box. And now once they chew through that newspaper, uh, your new brood chamber is still intact with your old brood chamber. And you're just kind of keeping your, your colonies in a more natural state. Um, that is fundamentally just how I requeen in my operation and three methods for, for you to be able to step away and do it. And the last thing I'll always say is there's a lot of good information on the internet. There's a lot of bad information on the internet. Don't let the internet kill your bees. Uh, you gotta be able to parse that stuff out. And thank you so much for allowing me to be part of your club this evening. If you have any questions, uh, by all means. If anybody would like to ask a question, you can just unmute and fire away. Somebody was asking about um, what, what type of paper to use. I said that uh, newspaper is the most common, but what, what else have you used? I've um, Sorry, I can hear an echo. Oh, I'm, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm sorry, for uh, new type of paper for, com, for a yeah. combination? Yeah, I mean, we've used burdock leaves before, um, yellow pages. I've used my time cards, not realizing they were my time cards from a notebook. Nice. Look, yeah, and then, and then literally have rushed back there and then been like, I don't know how to charge Mike now. Um, so the, the newspaper is simply a very thin film barrier preventing the bees from having direct contact immediately. Right. I don't know if any of you have ever done this, but if you put down paper or newspaper in between two hive boxes, we, we typically take our hive tool and make it a little slit. Um, if you come back 
that day. So let's say you do this in the morning, come back that, that evening, there'll already be a sizable hole where they've chewed it out. And bees are antenating between the two colonies and they're already touching each other. The smells are starting to, to flow back and forth. It's a very temporary barrier. Do you uh, cut slits in the paper at all or just lay it on? I'll lay it on and then I'll, I'll flip my hive tool and make a small slit in between. I, I take my hive tool and I just lay it flat and I can feel where two frames are. And then I'll just mm -hmm. flip my hive tool and make a small, small slit in between the, the frames. Yeah, just to yep. get them going. Okay. Yeah. So and, and then this is not with requeening, um, but this time of the year, if you have to do some new nights, um, you can still get away with it now. We have really warm weather. But this time of the year, if, if we get into cold weather and you have two weak colonies, don't use the newspaper at all. Um, it'll make a permanent barrier between two weak clusters. Uh, so up north, when we get, if we have colonies that get ahead of us um, and we're late into the season, um, so when we're in October, the season's way over. I don't kind of care where you are here in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, you know, we're winding down. It's it's winter in terms of the in terms of the bees. We'll we'll just combine them. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll just kind of reiterate that because if you go back, uh, they won't chew through that paper most often. Okay. Somebody asked, why not start out with the, the new queen below the honey instead of above it? Um, are we talking about uh, below the honey instead of above it? Yeah, I'm not sure unless it, it was just the last series. Oh, gotcha. You mean for like the, um, the Doolittle method? I think so. I, th yeah. I think that's what they're asking, yeah. Um, so because I'm only making, I only want to pull up nurse bees. Nurse bees accept queens very, very readily. So what I don't wanna do is put a lot of honey with that um, nuke on day one, because I'm also gonna pull up lots of older bees. They are not so keen on accepting a queen right away. Um, so that's one reason. The, the second is I am making a really small colony essentially. And if I take that honey box and originally put it on top, um, it's just more surface area they have to protect from robbing. Um, so it's just much easier to keep them into the smaller area and then have them on top of that honey super. Um, we are separating them from the rest of the colony. We want to extract nurse bees. Okay. <clears throat> um, Annie Harlow asks, do you get swarms? <laughs> yeah, <it counts. laughs> Like Absolutely. everybody. What do you think? I, I'm not Superman. I mean, <laughs> I just don't get angry about them now. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, um, so with swarming um, at Mike's, we, we super as quickly as possible. Uh, he systematically supers all of his calling. So every colony gets two supers right away. And, uh, and that's at Maples. So, um, the first year that I showed up, they were really late um, uh, supering. And I, I swear we were cutting swarm cells out of everything. It, it was obnoxious. And the next year I showed up and, and, and I had this 16 foot trailer that I was using to move my own bees. And I said, Mike, you know, how about we just put three, you know, how about we just fill it up with pallets of, uh, of honey supers. And when we drive to New York, we'll try to super everything one day. And he liked the idea of going out with more supers, but he didn't think we could actually super that much in one day. So he only gave me three pallets and our, and our one ton went out with like, I think it was two and a half pallets or two and a quarter, whatever. And uh, we, we were back by like three o'clock in the afternoon with everything off the truck and trailer supered. And, and so the next morning we just loaded as much as we could. <laughs> and uh, it's a fun story because it was, it was kind of cool to see Mike change, his, change how he did things just a little. But, yeah. but now let me get into the, the to the real about it about swarms so and especially here in maryland we can have a really heavy maple flow and they're going to try to crash all of that nectar right into the colony and if there's no honey supers on the colony they'll impede the the queen's brood nest to store that nectar and if they can't condense it and move it to the peripheries of the colony it'll stay there in the the brood nest you've restricted her ability to lay her laying space, you are starting the swarm impulse. They might not swarm until, you know, more, there's more incoming pollen and steady nectar and, and temperatures, but you're already starting it. So we, we 
we try to prevent that very, very early on by just placing two drawn supers on every single colony, just de facto, even medium colonies, because they're, they're going to get strong before we get back to them. If, especially here in Maryland, you know, we get a couple 60 or 70 degree days with those maples in bloom, and then they'll put on 30 pounds. They, well, might, they might consume it. They might consume it when we have two weeks of really crappy weather. That's okay. They can take it from the honey supers and bring it back down. But what I don't want it to do is just sit in that brood nest. So that's the first thing that we're doing uh, to, to, to prevent swarms is we're doing that proper supering right on time, which is at Maples. The next thing we're doing is we're going back out and re-supering. Um, and, and so we'll pop off um, those honey supers. And okay, so actually I'll, I'll talk about this really quickly because this is also how Kate and I started requeening. So, so colonies that are healthy store surplus resources upwards. Um, so if you go into a yard that has been supered and you start cracking boxes, we'll just fishtail our tool right to a corner, start to crack it. The first thing I feel is the weight of that box, right? Then I get a, a, a you know, kind of these peripheries, the smells from, you know, what's what I'm cracking because I'm breaking cells. I can smell the honey. Um, and then I can see inside of it. But the first thing I get is that weight, right? So I know if they're storing honey upwards. So if they're heavy, what we'll do is we'll take off a box or two and then throw an empty box underneath and then throw the box or two back on top. We're under supering. We're giving those bees more space to, space to store more honey. By the time I get to a colony, if, if every column in my yard is heavy, 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 and then, and then I open one and it's light, I'm like, what the, what's wrong with you? If, if the 10 others can make honey, what's, what's going on with you? I immediately go in for brood disease or queen issue. Um, this is actually how we're identifying colonies really early in the season to requeen them. If they were weak when we, at um, maples when we supered them, if they were weak when we came back at dandelions because they didn't store honey upwards, then I'm just going to write requeen on them. They're, they've shown me on multiple time points that they're not a strong colony. But long story short, that's how we're preventing swarms right early on is that early supering, re-supering, and then we'll re-super another time before before the May flow. And, and that's how our colonies will quickly go from these little brood boxes to having two, four, up to you know, six supers on them. Um, and the last way that we prevent supering is we'll get into some colonies that are just gangbuster. No matter what we do, they're gonna swarm. Um, so we'll do call outs in the yard. Hey, I've got a 13, you know, a colony with 13 frames of brood and cups. It's gonna swarm on us. And so, you know, someone might be working next to me who in their head knows I'm going to give up four frames of brood. And so they get into a weak colony. They go, I got a four over here, meaning you know, like four frames of brood. And they'll just take two or three frames of brood from me, give it to that weaker colony. It's essentially, we gave it a partial nuke. I'll take three of their empty frames, put it right into my colony, shut the thing back up as I'm working it. And all of a sudden we have this win-win situation. Um, so anyways, that's, that's the, in the nutshell early on um, how we're, um, preventing swarms, and then later on by the swapping of the frames as we're actually getting in to them when the weather's warmer. But um, yeah, are, I, I definitely have swarms. Are you ever pulling frames of nectar out of the uh, brood area if, if it looks like there's too much? Um, I'm pretty hands off with my brood chambers. Um, so, so part of this is because I, I tend to work my colonies by the yard, not the individual hive. Um, so I'm, I'm very often not pulling frames. I, I pull frames when I think there's an issue. Um, whereas if you have, uh, only a few colonies or especially if you only have one or two, you're, you're going to notice that much more than, than I would. Um, if that brood chamber is getting, uh, impacted by nectar. So it's, it's pretty typical in the, in the big, in the day when the honey flow is really strong for that nectar to end up in the brood chamber but the bees actively move it out to the peripheries of the colony and cure it um, so it doesn't stay in the brood chamber. So you could be in there in the middle of the day and see nectar in your brood chamber. Don't freak out, that's normal. Um, it's when it stays in the brood chamber because they have no other place to move it or they've stopped moving it because there's so much downward pressure of this incoming nectar coming in that it's it started this swarm impulse. Um, yeah, then you're gonna, then you're gonna have an issue. Um, but I, I typically don't get to do too much. Right now, one, right now I'm doing a lot of research. So if I have a swarm, I have a swarm. And otherwise I tend to work everything by the yard, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Um, so, yeah, somebody wanted to know details on the queen catching classes. Uh, if there's a website you can put up for everybody or. Yeah, um, there, there is a website if you will make me a website. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Um, there's not a there's not a website. So I, I actually usually just advertise via Facebook uh, once in the spring, and uh, I only offer a couple. They fill right up. Um, but uh, I'm primary. I'm finishing my thesis this spring, uh, so some organization on the business front has really gone to the wayside. Um, if you follow Tucka Seville on Instagram or Facebook. Um, if not, and you're on Instagram, uh, follow Tucka Seville. Uh, her, Sam Comfort and I will, um, we're not sure if it's gonna be in Florida or South Carolina, but this spring we're gonna be offering the queen rearing course again and the queen catches again. Um, and that's a great way to kind of connect with us and then come down and do a class. I'm not sure when they're gonna be this season in Maryland. I'm defending in April. So I'm, I'm not organizing anything until I, I do that. Um, that's just kind of where I am right now. So I'm sorry about that. Okay, could you spell Tucker's name? Yeah, Tucker Seville. So she's Tucka B on Instagram. So T-U-C-K-A and then B is in a honey bee. Uh, and if you type that in the internet, she pops up. Tucka B, okay. Yep. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Listen, my voice here. Um, somebody asked about under supering again. Yeah. When, when, when and why? Yeah, absolutely. So here, let me just go backwards and let me see if I can find a good picture. Okay, there's a good picture. So, oh, but there's no under super there. Come on, Mike. Oh, there we go. Uh, here, this this one will work. So, so why? Um, so first, you, your bees actually don't like walls to deal with. So if I put a box of nothing but capped honey in the middle of the colony. I've essentially created this artificial wall that partitions the colony. They, they really don't like that. If you look at a, a natural colony in a, in a small cavity, they organize themselves so they have a cluster space in the winter ensconced by resources that they need being pollen and honey. When your season kicks in, when you start to have incoming pollens and weather's getting warmer, that cluster space becomes brood first, expands, um, and then it condenses again as the swarm impulse uh, kicks in, it gets ensconced by honey. What you don't, but you always have that nucleus essentially in there that's either brooder or cluster space. What they never do is violate that. So there's never this partition it, longitudinally or, or, or in a latitude of just honey. But because we manage bees in these rectangular boxes, um, we could do that to a colony and we don't want to. So now that I just gave a long spiel, let's go right back here to Kate. So Kate's standing on a box doing an awesome pose. I keep thinking she has a coffee cup in her hand, but it's a, it's a hive tool. Um, and, and these two boxes on the top by her hand, I'm, I'm sorry, they're all coffee colored in olives, so that doesn't help, but the two top boxes, those were the first honey supers that went on top of the brood chamber, which is this cafe colored box right here. So at, in April, those were down here. When I showed back up, and cracked those boxes, they were super heavy, right? They're just full of dandelion honey. There's no room for any of the honeys that are gonna come, come afterwards. And, and the sumac flow up there is incredible. I mean, you have to have boxes for sumac. So what we do is we take those two heavy full boxes off, we place an empty box underneath it, which was this medium olive colored one right there and close it back up. When we show back up again, same thing. These are all full and we'll guesstimate how many more boxes it needs. In this case, someone added two. Um, what we're doing is we're constantly keeping the empty space between the capped honey and the brood chamber. When we violate space like that, the bees will come in and store their incoming nectar right there. What they don't do very well is go from their brood chamber across a honey wall to an empty box on the top to store the honey. They do that very poorly. So we're making this a little bit more efficient for the bees and we're violating this space to entice them to do so. Now, as I just described all that, would it just be easier to harvest that honey actively and put empty supers on the colony? Absolutely. Hell yes. Is that what we do? No. 
Um, and, and, and that's partially the result of Mike has roughly 750 commercial, uh, production colonies. What he doesn't have is a separate crew actively harvesting honey. Um, you know, those are two different animals. Could you do that in your backyard? Absolutely. Did I sufficiently answer that question? I think so. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me see who asked. Karen, was that okay? Yes, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, great. Yeah, because I have a lot of time. <clears throat> I do like seven harvests through the season. <clears throat> and I don't have as many supers as, as you do either with frames. Yeah, um, when the season, like uh, for us, when sumac and bass flow are hitting, um, you know, uh, sweet clover can be fickle depending on the weather, but when those two are hitting um, and every, it, it, if we've had a strong season up until then and everything's full, we'll just take whole frames or boxes of foundation and violate that space. We're never gonna do that to brood chambers, okay? So, so we're not gonna do that to a 10 frame brood chamber, but I will separate the brood chamber from the honey supers with 10 frames of deep foundation uh, on extremely um, hard honey flow. And okay. in upstate New York where you know, you can put on a hundred plus pounds just in basswood, you know, within that like 10 day period. Um, that's great. Um, the risk you play there is if the flow doesn't happen or the colony swarms prior to drawing out those frames, you've, you've permanently placed this foundation separating the colony. Um, and, and that's something you don't want to do. Okay. <clears throat> um, Robert asked, <clears throat> excuse me, um how do you decide to pull toss frames boxes with lots of excess bee bread uh, i never do okay there's ne never too much pollen in the hive um yeah i never pull my bee bread or i mean i'll pull really yucky frames let's say entombed pollen Wax buff damage, just look nasty, getting older. Sure, those can get tossed. Um, in terms of bee bread, um, your hive tends to organize, especially this time of the year, that bottom box, if you're running multiple boxes, that bottom box should be empty and it should predominantly be bee, bee bread this time of the year. Um, your bees are putting it down there for a very specific reason. They know that they're gonna be entering a period of stress where they will not be able to fly regularly outside the colony to procure resources but they will want to build up their uh, population prior to the onset of spring. So um, as the days are getting longer and pollens are just starting to come in, they have a, a protein reservoir that they've made below the colony. They'll go down there, they'll grab that bee bread and they can consume it and then rear brood. So if it's in that bottom box this time of year and that's what you're talking about, I just leave it. Um, you know, that's, they put it there. They knew they wanted to put it there. They put it through the effort of collecting it, storing it, fermenting it. They, they have to add nectar to ferment it. Um, they, they want it for that, that really early spring. If you're talking about the middle of the season, um, some colonies will perplexingly pack the brood chamber with pollen. I don't know why they do it. It doesn't seem to have a correlation between um, them surviving winter or not. So, so I don't touch it. Um, and, and that's just where kind of where I am. Okay, <clears throat> so you wouldn't, um, <clears throat> I guess, further to that topic, you wouldn't reverse hives at this time of year either, right? No, I don't. Um, okay. and, and I politely say, and absolutely not. Um, your, your colonies are actually really intuitive of what's coming next. And they've already have been changing their brood rearing um, mechanisms and their own physiology to, to be ready for winter. They've also orientated the colony to how they want it, which is typically uh, bee bread on the bottom of the colony, a cluster space in the center. And that cluster space is a result of them producing less and less and less brood. So there's just naturally a very small brood area somewhere, and then everything else is empty and sconced by honey. And, and that's how they'll establish themselves prior to winter and, and they'll go through winter that way. And, and so I don't, I don't miss with that. Great. <clears throat> um, one last thing for me is when you're running nine frames in a 10 box, mm -hmm. 
are you spacing them as you would a honey super or are they all crammed together in the middle or how do you do it yeah there's they're, they're actually slightly spaced more than a uh than 10 frames but not like a honey super the the two outside frames get a little fat okay yeah okay. and um it's a habit i got into from mike they look so much prettier when you have tens i'll admit that they really do um but i still run nines so i guess force a habit you know after you've been into you know a few hundred colonies a few times for a few years you get used to it the extra space is kind of nice i've done it a few times out of desperation mostly but um having the extra space is is kind of kind of nice yeah okay anybody else i'm getting down to the wire here a lot of compliments oh i see the chat yeah and, and, should, I, and should i should i should i uh oh i, I can spell her name uh Tucka seville and she's a badass beekeeper she also worked at mike she now has her operation between new york and and florida um should i stop sharing i'm worried that it will stop recording and i think you all want that but oh no i no i don't think it'll stop okay then i'm gonna stop sharing and that way we can see each other's faces so okay you know, sure you can so it's more yeah, of a social, oh yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah i'm really sorry about that people so it's more social we can all see each other it's all good cool well nobody's got their cameras on anyway yeah, everyone's so. hiding. <laughs> oh well good try well that was great zach i really appreciate it hope uh hopefully you'll have some time next year to come back and join us yeah, thank you very much. And, and actually, this is not Queens, but I'll give one parting advice. So, so my research, I uh, we essentially count how many mites or how many bites occur in a colony. So not how many mites, but how many bites those mites make. Um, and with um, a roughly like an 11% infestation in a colony, up to 70% of your bees are bit in five days. So Whoa. if you, yeah, so. <sighs> If, if you have colonies that you're going to get to treating, the mites aren't just actively sitting on one bee and, you know, sipping beer and watching reruns on Netflix. They're actively moving around biting other bees. So this is a time of the year where you can have noticeable numbers of mites, but that's not related to how many bites they're actually taking, which is magnitudes more. So if you've been sitting on your treatments, or I like to say mite management, because I, I really don't care if you treat or not. I'm just concerned if you have eff efficacious mite management. Um, don't sit on it. It's not one of those things you can sit around on. So. Okay, good tip. Um, yeah, the video will be available. I'll send out a link to everybody um, <clears throat> probably in about a week. And there was one last question regarding you keeping boxes on the ground. I don't know if they're actually on the ground or not. But uh, asking about small small hive beetle relative to that. Yeah, so um, at Mike's, we got into this habit of uh, running our hive stands, which are two by fours on ends. They're, we call them H frames. Um, they're awesome, I like them, and it's what I'm used to. Um, I don't have any issues with hive beetles. I mean, we'll find them in the colonies, they corral them up to the top of the frames, but we're not getting trashed colonies from hive beetles. So I don't, I don't, I don't worry about it. Are you running so solid bottoms or, or screened? I have a mix. I, I've, okay. uh, when, when my business partner left for Germany, I ended up inheriting some of uh, her screen bottoms. And then I have tons of uh, wooden bottoms that I used to make. Um, so I have a mix of them. So okay. they, both, they both work. What are wax worms? It's a question. So, so, yeah, we have, so we have the greater and the lesser wax moth uh, here. And you'll find both type of worms in your, in your colony. Um, if you see a series of uncappings in a row of pupa, um, there's often a wax moth larva burrowing underneath those cells. The bees are detecting it and they're starting to uncap. They'll actually actively uncap, cap, uncap, cap those cells, um, which is kind of fun to, to see. Um, but these wax moths will bury through and you don't notice them most of the time because your bees are removing them before they get a, a chance to come on out. Um, but the moment that you no longer have bees covering a frame, all of those larvae um, just decimate the frame and you can see them coming out and they get nasty, especially with small hive beetles, also producing larvae that decimate your frames. So, okay, anyways, I'll stop that one. Oh, wow, it's nine. Okay.
Thank you. Cool. He says. Thank you very much. That's very informative. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Zach. Cool. Thanks, y'all. I'll head on out. Have a great one. See you in the spring.